holy William Shakespeare, Tim. It's a 1966 Batman script. Great Scott, Paul. We'd better analyze it immediately. My mic's at the ready. I'm recording now. To To the the Bat Poles! I'm going to play the Batman theme. Welcome to To the Bat Poles. The weather today, nice warm 76 degrees temperature. (laughs) This is Tim in Tokyo with my brother Paul in Hanover, New Hampshire. It's about 60 degrees temperature Fahrenheit where I am. (laughs) Our theme version this time was from the YouTube channel of pianist Derek Paravicini, uploaded October 5th, 2019. We've encountered a lot of theme versions on YouTube by individuals playing the piano or guitar or organ that get monotonous after a while. This is definitely not one of those. (laughs) Certainly. Really keeps your interest. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's pretty wild. Vild, I should say. Vild. I noticed, too, that his his piano is is called a kawaii. K-A-W-A-I must be a Japanese brand. It's a Japanese brand, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Not kawaii, not cute. Only one eye right. at the end. <laughs> right, and not scary either. Not kawaii, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cute, scary piano. Run for your lives. Aww. <laughs> so yes, he's apparently both um, vision impaired and um, autistic, I've read, mm. um, which is interesting. I'm not sure why that information is, is out there, but uh, it's he's he's a obviously very talented and um, quite a quite an improviser yeah oh my gosh i know somebody in the comments had had pointed out it sounded a little bit like flight of the batmobile (laughs) yes indeed okay so this time another script we have the script for what became Instant Freeze uh, by Max Hodge. Well, we actually got two documents. Uh, there is a what's called a preliminary... Well, the University of Wyoming, the American Heritage Center, calls it a preliminary script. It's not really a script. It's just an outline of the story. Yeah, it's more like an extended treatment, I would call it. Yeah, and the title typed on it is Mr. Zero. So at this stage, he was just taking the character as he was named in the comic, the one comic he had appeared in. Mm -hmm. Um, But then it's crossed out and Freeze is written in, um, perhaps by Howie Horowitz. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a first draft script, which is, you know, a full script uh, dated November 8th, 1965. So, you know, it's one of those early pre-filming scripts. And so you've got kind of the earmarks of that, the supered titles rather than narration. Uh, Inspector Bash shows up once. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of him, I, you know, we the only time we ever actually see him on screen is in High Diddle Riddle. And mm-hmm. I really wonder what Semple was thinking inventing that character I mean, apparently they quickly decided that they didn't need him. Um, and I can see why they didn't need him, because you've already got, quote unquote, the world's greatest detective on this show. Why do you need a, a police inspector on top of it? Right. It seemed as though there may have been on um, Semple's mind, at least, some concept of the detect- detection being done by a team or um, Batman teaming up with mm. the the police department rather than basically doing its work for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I think I think that kind of made the show too crowded, not unlike bringing Batgirl in. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so it's a lesson that was learned and then forgotten by season three. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. As the concern became to just like save the show by any means necessary. Yeah. Yeah. yeah appeal to the dirty old man market and little girls. <laughs> hmm. Now, I put these scripts on the message board, you know, created a thread for it as I always do, but I forgot to mention it on the show or to put it in any past show notes of it, you know, past episodes. So that might be why there wasn't much response. I don't know. Mm-hmm. A couple of uh, a couple of people posted. Um, I will put these documents in the show notes of this episode, so you can follow along at home as we're going through these. Mm-hmm. So, first of all, let's look at this preliminary quote-unquote script. So, since he's called Mr. Zero, as Hodge typed it, it's not 50 below yet. He just needs to be at zero degrees. He, mm-hmm. Mr. Freeze, or Mr. Zero, needs it to be zero degrees. Mm-hmm. Now, I just made a list of a few things that are in this uh, kind of outline that are not in the first draft script, things that get changed okay. by, by that point. Because there's there's a lot that's the same. Right. Well, this um, is a good place to start. But uh, unique to the quote-unquote preliminary script. Um, so Dick Grayson is referred to as Dicky throughout, <laughs> <laughs> which is scribbled on by, by uh, Horowitz. That Inspector Bash appearance I mentioned, he's gone by the first draft script. Mm-hmm. People who are frozen die. Right. Um, and as High C posted on the board, I noticed how Freeze, then Zero, and now thanks to you guys, we understand why that change was made, racked up quite a body count in the treatment. Hodge obviously was told that was a no-no before he went to script. So, right. yeah. On page six, the guard is instant frozen um, when Mr. Zero turns the ice gun on him and he is left as a dead human statue. <laughs> or and, a stiff stiff, um, as he puts it in a later <laughs> instance of uh, something similar. But, yeah, reading that, reading the quote-unquote preliminary script, I'll stop saying quote-unquote, I got the impression that Hodge wasn't quite sure what the tone of the show was supposed to be and that he maybe didn't realize it was supposed to be sort of a comedy mm, and for mm-hmm. kids or, you know, trying mm-hmm. to get that kid audience. Cause he seems to be playing it, you know, even a little more seriously than the green Hornet was played at times. Yeah. Um, although the, the, the flop German accent um, of, <laughs> of, of Mr. Freeze or Mr. Zero hmm. seems played for something like comedy, um, even in the preliminary, although there's not nearly as much reference to it or as much use of it, since this is not hmm. so much a dialogue um, run through as it is a summary of the plot. Yeah. So since freezing kills you, that means you know, we can't freeze Batman and Robin. Mm-hmm. So the end of part one is hardly a cliffhanger at all. Batman and Robin are just left standing there outside the hotel uh, as they watch. Now, I thought this was interesting. A dirigible with an electric sign on it that says strike two on Batman, mm-hmm. which makes much more sense, uh, much more sense than skywriting at night. But <laughs> but by the first draft, it is skywriting at night explicitly. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Right, so there's a rundown um, the, at the end of part one on page 13 of the preliminary. Strike two on Batman? What does it mean? Three strikes and he's out? What will be the third strike? When will Mr. Zero pitch it to the Batman? What more precious gem is there in the world than the Giaccio Circolo? Is it possible Batman has finally met his match? Um, and then Horowitz is written under the words end of part one, cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you know, here's what's missing. Yeah, it's not much of a da 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 da. What's going to happen now um, is not much of a cliffhanger um, no. compared to others, like, you know, Robin nearly being sawed in half by the Riddler. <laughs> um, it's only vaguely mentioned that Batman was involved in Schimmel becoming Freeze or Zero. Uh, mm-hmm. And then in part two, when Batman and Robin are at dinner with Freeze, there's a big flashback sequence labeled as optional as Schimmel tells the whole story of becoming Freeze in a 
in way more detail than the show needs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, to wit, what winds up uh, in the final version um, left over from that is simply, you know, a verbal description that uh, doesn't go into nearly that kind of excruciating detail. And uh, the baseball player is called Don Diamante instead of Paul. And he doesn't appear in part one at all. There's mm -hmm. nothing in the in the cold open about baseball players. The cult open. <laughs> so that was my list. Can you think of anything else that was in the preliminary that's not in the first draft? Um, let's see. Well, the parade. Well, the parade's in the first draft too. Oh right, right. Of course, of course. Yes, I'm now. I'm thinking about uh, what, what lines was, up in what the was broadcast. Version. Yeah. Right. Although, you know, the parade makes no sense to me in either instance. Well, since we're on that topic, I, I was I think the main reason that I thought to get this script was because I was wondering what the heck the bit was with the five Batman and five Batmans and five Mr. Freezes. Exactly. And, and it doesn't make any more sense to me in the script than it does on, as shot. <laughs> Yeah, I don't get it either. How is how is the parade supposed to discredit Batman and Robin? Um, you know, the multiple Batmans and the multiple Mr. Freezes or Mr. Zeros? I, yeah, I don't have any more um, explanation in front of me, it seems, than we did before. Ma'am. Um, okay, so let's go on to the first draft. Okay. By this time, the title is now Mr. Freeze, which, of course, was actually an episode title for part two of the Wallach freeze arc mm -hmm. um so it's not it's not instant freeze yet so it starts with both of them start with uh two ice dispensers being attacked with a flamethrower by someone dressed as an astronaut riding an ice cream truck who could it be <laughs> um so yeah that's tossed out then of course we have the ice rink um <laughs> where many people are screaming after Freeze melts the ice rink. And of course, as shot, we get one person screaming. The two kids who have speaking parts outside of the ice rink have names, Denny and Kay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, once I saw this, I wondered, you know, it made a lot of sense that even though it doesn't happen this way as shot, they're dripping wet. Mm -hmm. Because the ice rink mel melted, but... Right, right. Are there any ice rinks that are open in the middle of summer anywhere in the world? I just, I just want to know. Oh, they're indoor ones. I suppose so, but it's not something one thinks of as a summer sport, even when one is doing indoor ice rink skating. <laughs> mm, well, I think at least the ice rink that Charles Schultz had built in California. Uh, <laughs> right, of course. Where it's yes, always I, summer. I guess, I guess I haven't lived in an ice skating town long enough to really know that. Hanover is definitely... You know, a, a place where, like, ice hockey is something kids want to play, unlike mm -hmm. other parts of the country. Um, but, no, I just, you know, don't don't have a sense of the permanence of such venues. Mm -hmm. Now, did you notice, the first time it happens is with Denny's line outside of the uh, ice rink, as written. Mm -hmm. uh, he uses the word crazy. And Howie Horowitz yes. crosses it out. And it happens a number of times in here. Hodge writes crazy and Horowitz crosses it out. And I wondered what, what was his problem with the word crazy? Yeah, the same goes for when Commissioner Gordon calls Robin that, you know, crazy brave kid mm -hmm. near the end um, yeah. when Robin decides to go and save, try to rescue Batman. I don't get it either. Um, I thought it might be because the term seemed too hip, you know, dig that crazy X uh, and Y yeah, that... in, in, in the case of Commissioner Gordon, but, you know, calling, Denny calling the um, apparent Martian something else that gets cut out of the, uh, the, uh, the preliminary. Um, every time somebody calls Mr. Freeze a Martian, Howie Horowitz seems to have crossed it out. 
you know, yeah. just because he looks like he's wearing a space suit. Denny but, says, um, some crazy maniac. Um, <laughs> as shot, it's some kook. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And Kay says, and it's, it, it denotes that she speaks in a nasal voice. And she says, in a space suit. Denny says, melted the ice with a flamethrower. And Kay says, like that, and snaps her fingers. Mm-hmm. Instead, we get Terry Gar saying, with a flamethrower yet. <laughs> Some coop melted the ice rink with a flamethrower yet. I guess not so much a nasal um, as a Brooklyn accent in that yeah. case. It's liver and Um Anyway. <laughs> Shlameo, Shlamazo. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if, if um, there was some kind of network sensor cracked out on crazy. Who knows? Um, mm. In this, in the case of Denny calling um, Mr. Zero a cra- or Mr. Freeze a crazy maniac, um, maybe the redundancy police was after the script. <clears throat> some crazy mm. maniac who is insane. <laughs> Also nutty. And imbalanced. (laughs) Uh, So then the following scene at the GCPD is much longer. And Mm -hmm. Denny and Kay show up there and have lines. Mm -hmm. So Terry Garr almost got a much bigger role, or a little bit bigger role. Yeah, shame she didn't. Um, Did you notice that Horowitz, apparently Horowitz again, writes on page two of the first draft here that uh, this script is ten pages too long? Mm-hmm. including way over in use of titles. Um, so Horowitz was thinking about cutting stuff, you know, just trimming whatever fat he could, apparently. Mm. Yeah, he also well, asked for an explanation of the parade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he was confused, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, never mind the the multiple Batmans and Freezes. There's no explanation for what the parade is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is it the 4th of July or... Right. But yeah, so way over in use of titles. So it sounds like maybe he's on the way to deciding to go with narration, but hasn't gotten mm. there yet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, this is still November sixty five. Although I don't know the dates of when High Diddle Riddle was shot or well, not when it was shot, I guess when it was edited would have been the important mm-hmm. thing. So I would imagine that was going on around this time, because I think it was shot in, like, September, October, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Say, something just occurred to me. You know, Hodge has written into the script um, uh, intertitles, basically, like, you know, um, for the lines that Mr. Free speaks in German. Do you suppose that's what Horowitz is referring to specifically? Because he's crossed out all those intertitles. Well, that could be it, too. Yeah, Freeze and I think his henchmen also have some German lines with subtitles, you know, translating them. That might be what he's getting at. Yeah, not mm-hmm. just the the super titles that became narration, but yeah, all those translation subtitles too. I wonder why Hodge insisted on that. <laughs> hmm. Well, I don't know. Maybe he just wanted to emphasize that they were German. Yeah, why was Mr. Freeze German, I wonder? Probably, well, it's only 20 years since World War II. That's all I can think of. I'm reminded of the Simpsons line, how can anyone who speaks German be evil? (laughs) Sorry, Germany. (laughs) (laughs) Let's see. Oh, and also in that scene with Gordon, there's no diabolical snowman line. Uh, The dialogue Mm -hmm. in general is quite different. I mean, there are some similarities here and there, but... Um, you know, in the first part of the script, uh, especially part one, it it feels like you know it was completely rewritten for the final, and mm-hmm. kind of getting across the same points. But you know, you you can hardly even pick out any lines in the first mm, ten fifteen pages that were used as shot. Yes, that's right. Scene with Paul Diamante is not much different. Hmm. So when Batman and Robin are in Gordon's office and talking about Freeze's origin, uh, Robin isn't aware of Batman's involvement in that. 
Horowitz writes, uh, Robin would know all this. Let O'Hara ask the questions. Um, although as shot, everybody knows it. And they're, you know, just Gordon O'Hara and Robin are always all trying to talk Batman down. You know, mm-hmm. it's not your fault. And, you know, they just say enough extra to fill the audience in. You know, it's not your fault that he got that gunk still spilled all over him or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Of course he wants revenge. I'm not so sure I blame him. It was an accident, Batman. You didn't mean to knock that beaker of instant freeze on him during the fight in his laboratory. The boy wonder is right. He was the culprit, Batman. Experimenting with those devilish instant freeze solutions and for some criminal purpose, undoubtedly. True, Commissioner. Right, but, the, but you know, d- going back to earlier discussions of early drafts of scripts where we've seen those kinds of moves made that tell us something about the philosophy <laughs> of Robin, you know, mm-hmm. the, uh, the understanding of Robin's character... Um, having part of what this script, both versions, kind of, you know, shows us is the degree to which Robin was still kind of infantilized in the minds Mm. of some writers who Mm -hmm. were looking at him as the chubby Mm. eight-year-old instead of the partner that he'd become in the new look Batman in the comics. Yeah, I mean, it implies that this was a solo Batman adventure Mm -hmm. when, you know, when he turned Schimmel into Freeze accidentally um, but yeah, apparently, yeah, Horowitz and Semple are thinking Batman and Robin have been doing this for a while and, and mm-hmm. Robin's yeah. In high school, um, maybe he started right. out as a chubby eight year old. We don't really get the backstory of this version of Batman, but right. But even the reference, um, the princess's reference to Dick as Dickie, um, and saying, my, how he's grown um, when she meets mm. him. All of that is removed as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, any reference to a kind of, you know, pre-Robin uh, Dick Grayson or even an early Robin <laughs> uh, get eliminated, more or less, um, mm-hmm. in favor of making Robin more aware, more, you know, on top of things, more, you know, as knowledgeable of Batman as the past of their operation. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting how the show made Batman and Robin's backstory like a non-issue. You know, we mm-hmm. get a couple of origin mentions early on. You know, the mm-hmm. my parents were killed by dastardly criminals. Don't mention it, Mr. Harris. Perhaps if there'd been anti-crime centers of the type you now propose when my own parents were murdered by dastardly criminals. And uh, um, is it the Penguin story at the end when Gordon is talking at a party about... Uh, why Batman used a bat as a symbol or something. Mm. The origin of the bat costume, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is simple. As Batman realized when he set out in this crusade, nothing so strikes terror into the criminal mind as the shape and shadow of a huge bat. And that's basically it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we we don't know when Dick Gord, we don't know when Dick Grayson arrived there. We don't know when he became Robin. We don't know how long mm-hmm. ago Bruce became Batman. Um, you know, there's there's just no exploration of that at all. They must have felt yeah. like it would clutter up the show too much or something. Right. I think that's right. All we know is this is in Medias Race. Um, probably just enough, you know, for us to understand that um, the police department trusts Batman implicitly. Mm hmm. Are you tired of fanboy comics podcasts? Looking for a show that really appreciates the comic storytelling medium and how it works? A show that looks at comics from any genre and anywhere in the world, comparing the storytelling techniques of different creators in different comics cultures, with manga, newspaper strips, European comics, and more, discussed alongside mainstream U.S. comics. A show that includes talks with well-known creators like James Robinson and Dan Juergens, and with less famous creators that you really should know. And hey, we'll even critique your comic. If you're looking for that show, then you're looking for Deconstructing Comics, and it's right here at DeconstructingComics.com. Also available in iTunes and on Stitcher. This is Tim saying, check out our show on Wednesdays. That's Deconstructing Comics. I also noticed... so. As broadcast, the name Schimmel is mentioned exactly twice that I can identify. Once in part mm-hmm. one, once in part two. Tell him yourself, Dr. Schimmel. Back to the cooler, Dr. Schimmel. But in the script, he's mentioned 
much more often as Schimmel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wonder if if that was consciously cut out. I wonder if they just thought it might be confusing to keep calling him by two different names. That was my guess. Um, because especially late in the second episode, in the in the first draft script, um, Batman actually calls Freeze Doctor Schimmel a number of times, mm-hmm. and Freeze responds to it. Um, I do think that that would have been somewhat confusing to call him Mister Freeze most of the time, and then just you know kind of shift gears into calling him by his given name. There's a possible psychological reason for that. You know, we could be seeing this. We could understand this as Batman attempting to, you know, kind of drill down into uh, Freeze's humanity and refer to him, you mm. know, not as his criminal doppelganger, as it were, but um, to you know, refer to his his uh, original identity. That could backfire since, you know, it's Dr. Schimmel who doesn't really get to be Dr. Schimmel anymore as a result of Batman's accident, but still. Mm-hmm. But there doesn't seem to be that much, you know, there's not much let's call it script technology behind <laughs> the idea there, you know, th- there's not much to support the idea that Batman is trying to appeal to um, the humanity of Mr. Freeze, except just the use of the name. Yeah. I mean, if I'm looking at the, the scene of Batman and Robin in Gordon's office uh, after the first commercial break, I see Schimmel here at least three times. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, special guest villain, George Sanders as Dr. Schimmel. <laughs> Dr. Freeze Schimmel or Dr. Schimmel Freeze. <laughs> so, yeah, that scene is pretty much all rewritten from scratch. So, Freeze's henchmen have German names. They're not Chill, Nippy, and Mo. And I don't know what <laughs> Mo has to do with being cold, but. Probably the same thing that Clyde has to do with Inky Winky and Blinky, I suppose. Mm. Al, Joe, Klaus, and Otto. I think I think uh, High C uh, mentioned yeah. how ironic it is that yeah. Otto is the name of one of the hench people, considering <laughs> who would play Mr. Freeze in the next appearance yeah. of the character. Wild. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, they sort of, yeah, they talk to each other in German somewhat. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least Freeze talks to them in German. I'm, I mean, maybe the, the henchmen don't have German lines. Uh, I think Kla- Klaus does. He says, yeah, with the superimposed <laughs> translation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, or yes. As, as if we couldn't figure that out, even with, with no German understanding. Yeah, that one in particular made me wonder if the superimpositions were meant as comedy, which made me think maybe the author does get that this is campy mm. or that mm. this is being the humorous aspects are mm-hmm. being played up. And let's let's face it, um, in the post-war world, um, German was not unknown to the American public. Um, yeah. You know, not just the GIs, but uh, there was a fair dissemination of at least, you know, some German slang and some everyday German words. Um, not deep, you know, we're not, not a, there's not deep knowledge, but heck, um, you know, you and I as kids can understand most of what was going on in Hogan's Heroes when a little German was spoken. <laughs> We didn't have to have Octung translated for us, mm. certainly. Yeah, and we watched that before I had actually studied any German in high school. Right. And there were no, and which, just to mention, there were no supertitles or intertitles, uh, or excuse me, um, subtitles, I should say, um, in, in Hogan's Heroes that I can ever remember. Hmm. Hodge mentions a portable nine inch square remote control panel with 144 buttons that Freeze carries in a special pocket in his jacket. I mean, the, the what they got in the show was something that was too big for anybody's jacket pocket. Uh, he's got actually <laughs> kind of a shoulder bag that he carries it in. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's... His man purse. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Hodge seemed to imagine it as like an iPhone size or something, pocket size, but, yeah, it's... Mm-hmm. Or an iPad size, maybe, but uh, no, it they couldn't make it that small, even if it was fake. I mean, who could tell how many buttons it actually has on it? I don't think it could have had 144. I love the idea of there being a single separate button for every single zone, perhaps. Is that what we're supposed to assume? Um, you know, different heating and cooling mm. zone in, uh, in Mr. Freeze's hideout. 
Um, it's such a 60s way to understand technology where instead of having like, you know, a touchpad or something <laughs> that allows you to, you know, move the cursor around to different zones, um, mm. as it were, you've mm-hmm. just got, uh, you've got a button for each and every zone. It's like light switches. Pretty much, yeah. It's like yeah. Anal- it's it's an analog understanding of um, switching technology. Hmm. Yeah, but yeah, he imagined it portable nine inch square, and it looked to me more like it's twelve by twelve, maybe. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. There's no zoom, zoom, zoom. Dang. <laughs> uh, Nippy, have you ordered the airplane to go zoom, zoom, zoom? Yeah, boss. The henchman Otto says he's recruited. Not five, but 12 Batmans and 12 Mr. Freezes. Right. Uh, Horowitz changes it to eight, but then it ends up being five as shot. (laughs) And even that was too many. Yeah, I was going to say, can't you imagine the negotiations going on at the writer's table? Four, six, okay, five. (laughs) We'll compromise. (laughs) Why was it such a big deal? I suppose because they had to worry about how many extras they would hire and how many suits they would have to construct Mm -hmm. in each case. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you can see the typical scriptwriter problems here where the writer is giving no thought to how expensive something would be to do or if the technology even existed to do some of these things. I thought of that immediately in the preliminary reading about the crisscross over the ice machine, Um, the Mm. crisscross of the heat ray and the cold ray, I guess. Um, Yeah, well, the gun does both heat and cold at this stage. First draft, page one, fade in. Exterior automatic ice dispenser, night. Brightly lit king-size self-service coin-in slot type, probably adjacent to a gasoline station in the heart of Gotham City. But the locale, nor the weather, hot, steaming summer night, can be determined as the dispenser fills the screen. Suddenly, a darting flame from a powerful flamethrower off-shot shoots one direction, then the other across the dispenser followed immediately by a cold, blue-white, foamy substance tracing the same crisscross pattern. Steam bellows forth with a loud sssing sound. When the steam quickly evaporates, the ice dispenser stands revealed, cracked open like it had been dropped from a great height. Ice cubes tumble to the ground. Another flame burst and the ice cubes melt instantly, without even a wet trace. Sound, off shot, a sinister laugh, as though coming from the bottom of a well, and then squealing tires as a truck pulls away. Whip pan, too. Exterior, another automatic ice dispenser, night. Established in a deserted parking lot. An ice cream truck pulls up beside the dispenser. A figure dressed very much like an astronaut, with plastic helmet, oxygen tank attached, and thermotype suit, leaps from the rear door of the truck aims a double-barreled flamethrower-type weapon at the dispenser. Again, flames shoot out from one barrel, followed by the blue-white foamy substance from the other barrel. Steam billows. The ice dispenser cracks wide open, ice spilling to the ground, instantly melted with a short blast from the flame barrel. Again, that same hollow, mocking laugh as the figure leaps back into the truck, the truck speeds away. Yeah, that seemed already like it was going to cost an arm and a leg and um, a a fair amount of conceptual time and design time, as Mm -hmm. well as just the technology to and the special effects to make it look convincing. Yes. On page 15, when Freeze says he'll destroy Batman, he savagely bangs his fist on the table. There's an extreme close shot of his fist with pow and brilliant flashes. Um, and I'm thinking Hodge is trying to play up the comic book aspect here. Sure. Um, of course, that's all tossed out. But, mm-hmm. yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the, of course, the show had the the uh, fight sounds on the screen and occasional, like, flashes when somebody gets hit on the head or something. But, you know, they... Of course, we know that that was expensive and they ended up having to just do cards without I'm not sure quite the technology we're talking about here but season two 
You mm-hmm. can't see the fight going on behind the POW. Right, the optical printing of the um, the superimposition then mm-hmm. of the POW and BAM and the, the titles on top of the action is something they cut out because it does cost more mm-hmm. than just like shooting those intertitles and inserting them in the editing sequence. Yeah, so maybe this is just a cost issue that he took out this uh, close-up of the fist with POW and brilliant flashes. Well, it could be. At the same time, I think that the um, those moments of comic booky um, superimpositions slash um, captions, I guess you'd call them, um, may have been there. May have been an effort to kind of reduce those or keep them um, focused on the fight scenes, just so they didn't become too distracting at other moments in, mm-hmm. the, in the shooting. Mm-hmm. So it may have been partly cost, but I think also um, partly an attempt to contain the the comic booky visual language um, to the fight scenes where it gave them the most bang for their buck, mm-hmm. so to speak. So to speak, yeah. So after the after the scene in Freeze's hideout, there is not a scene of Batman testing out the anti freeze capsule in the Batcave. Mm-hmm. I noticed though, watching it again that Alfred mentions bursting ice dispensers. Hot tea might be more appropriate, Alfred, under the circumstances. I anticipated the circumstances, sir. Piping hot. Anticipated? Uh, Yes, sir, from the morning newspaper. A rather strange little column concerning melted ice rinks and bursting ice dispensers might lead one to suppose that uh, Mr. Freeze was back in town again. Which is interesting oh. to add a scene that talks about a scene that's cut. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think I just kind of bleeped over that before. Like, what does that mean? Oh, well. But yeah, now I understand what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I just thought that was odd. Very. So instead, we go to the parade that we mentioned before, uh, which Aunt Harriet is watching on TV. Mm-hmm. Um, what is the parade for? Who knows? It's, it's just, for watching on TV, clearly. Yeah, it's it's for having a, multiple Batmans and Mister Freezes marching in. Mm-hmm. So, and the bat, yeah, the Batmans and Freezes are actually marching in the parade. And of course, Bruce and Dick see this on TV and immediately make an excuse that they're off to play tennis. And you know, Miss Aunt Harriet is kind of aghast because it's really hot outside uh too hot to play tennis but Mm -hmm. must be 90 in the shade yeah but uh of course they're actually off to play superhero right um apparently the batmans and freezes are meant as a distraction while freeze robs the diamond exchange Mm Hmm. so yeah he does steal the star of cashmere the scene is you know, again, completely rewritten in the final. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I still don't get the multiple Batmans and freezes. Yeah, um, the multiple strikes against Batman um, that that do, you know the the multiple Batmans and multiple Mister Freezes are you know supposed to somehow um, struck. Maybe there, there's an, supposed to be an irony to the fact that there are all these Batmans and all these Mr. Freezes and, you know, Batman, none of the fake Batmans catch the fake Mr. Freezes. And meanwhile, the real Mr. Freeze gets away with something, but it's pretty far fetched. You really yeah, have to and, reach to come up with that explanation. Poorly explained. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's as poorly explained as the reason for having a parade, other than right. that it, that it, because he want Hodge wanted a parade, <laughs> right? But thanks to the scene, I have Led Zeppelin's "Cashmere" running through my head on you know, infinite repeat. Da 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 with the strike one message one for each fake batman and each fake mr freeze and it occurred to me watching it again that first skywriting scene it would have been nice if it were earlier in the episode Mm. i mean as you're watching it 
without commercials on DVD, you're 17 minutes in. You know, you've mm-hmm. got like six or seven minutes left. And so that the the strike one comes a little too close to the strike two at the end of the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, it would have been nice to space them out a little better. Right. But I guess they couldn't just couldn't fit it, all the Batmans and Freezes in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And and still do the uh, the strike one in a timely way. I guess not, but it does seem like they're kind of cramming everything into the toe of the sock um, <laughs> when it wouldn't. It, it's more interesting to have some suspense built up about what the second strike is going to be, if you ask me. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. There, there's no time for the suspense because already it's strike two. Mm-hmm. Page 25, later in the Batcave, it says, As the title fades out, the super title, camera holds on a large, edge-lighted, lucite map of Gotham City, and Horowitz writes, Label it. (laughs) And thus the giant, lighted, lucite map of Gotham City is born. Thank goodness. (laughs) Howie Horowitz's masterpiece. (laughs) So, but we didn't know that Hodge was part of the impetus. For right. you know, for having it there, you know, he was it was his idea to have it, and Horowitz is to label it. If only there were a little advertising language at the bottom of the Lucite map that said "Now with luminous X marks at a dozen different places," <laughs> which is also straight from Hodge's script. <laughs> yes, in that scene, Robin calls Batman "Sir," which is crossed out. Yeah, boy, that was strange. Because yeah, I don't think he ever called him anything other than Batman when he was in costume. Hmm. Certainly not caped crusader or anything like that. That's that's as verboten as Batman calling Robin Boy Wonder or addressing right. him as that. Right. So, but yeah, Robin never even calls him chum, I don't think. He's always just Batman. Mm-hmm. And certainly not sir, I don't think. Yeah, chum um, would be too productive for the adult of the the duo, I think. Yeah. So finally, on page 26, partway through this Batcave scene, there's... A stretch of two and a half pages where the dialogue is basically the same as the final. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, I recognize this. (laughs) (laughs) And as they're talking in the Batcave, so there's a line in the final where they both say, that's it. And again, uh, Hodge tries to play up the comic bookiness of it. Pop in brilliant starburst, blanking out the Batcave scene with its glare, with superimposed words, that's it. Interesting idea. Kind of an interesting idea, yeah. Yeah. I don't think I would dislike that. But again, if the final decision was to keep the Bash Pow um, intertitle slash superimpositions um, contained in the fight scenes, um, Mm -hmm. it might have seemed odd to us if this sort of thing had been, you know, just out in the wild, so to speak. Well, as I'm thinking about it, I kind of feel like it would be distracting. Mm-hmm. To have the the you know something with with that much impact, like you know in uh, what is it Penguin's Nest when uh, the cop gets the electric shock and there's a little bit of lightning around his head, but it's subtle. Mm-hmm. Uh, or when Zelda the Great uh, at the beginning of that story hits the guard over the head or something, right? Or when Batman gets blackjacked um, when he's in the in the bag. Yeah, so there's a little bit, but it's not. It doesn't hit you over the head, and I think something. Yeah, (laughs) I think something this big would be distracting. It makes it feel like something different to me. Um, Some, I feel like if they're gonna do that, then they'd have to have it happen happening all the time, practically. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's, it would be hard. It would be hard to know when to stop um, uh-huh. and where to draw the line. Because I think if you if you have something that big, you know, outside of the fight scenes, then in the, if there are long breaks between those, you kind of wonder like why. <laughs> I thought yeah. this was a show that was going to play up the comic bookiness. Why is it so sparing? That's a really good point, Tim. So it, we, it might get to the point where every time something uh, like a flash of light when somebody gets hit or uh, you know electrocuted or zapped or whatever, if that didn't show up, then the audience would be distracted by the fact that it's not there. Yeah. 
and wonder why they're not seeing it all the time. Mm -hmm. So um, yet another good reason to contain that sort of thing into specific types of scenes. Yeah. So then page 29, uh, we oh, see... Oh, let, 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 hmm. let me point something out here first. Did we ever comment on the fact that um, Princess Sandra of Molin, uh, Molino is definitely Princess Grace of Monaco? That is Grace Kelly. Yeah, I'm sure we talked about that in our first episode yeah, episode. We, we must have. Way back six years ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so page 29, the first time we see Princess Sandra, she's at a press conference. Now, as shot... Uh, they change it to she's tending to her social affairs, as Desmond Doomsday says, and thus the scene has many fewer people in it, and a few buckets of money are saved. Yes. <laughs> uh, but in this press conference, a reporter asks Sandra if she didn't used to date Bruce Wayne, because she mentions that she's he's going to be escorting her to the baseball game. Mm-hmm. Um, and she just says, well, I'm a married woman now. Uh, she doesn't really confirm or deny. Um, but, uh, yeah, the connection between Bruce and Sandra is left a lot vaguer in the final. Mm-hmm. You don't really know if there was romance there or not. Right. So the dialogue is completely different in the scene until the alleged crate of beef is delivered. And then you start to see the similarities to the final. Of course, Sandra's, as the script calls him, Sandra's lackey uh, is frozen and falls over, quote, with a cracking thud. And on the cracking thud on TV ended up sounding like something shattering. Mm hmm. But both the draft and the final let us know that the guy survived, but they do it in different ways, as we'll get to a little later. Yes. Not surprisingly, Hodge wrote the the hotel scene as Batman and Robin using the bat rope to climb up. But the building that they ended up using made that kind of both difficult and unnecessary, because there was enough kind of gingerbread on the thing that they could just climb up that way. Mm Mm-hmm. So, on page 34, rather than setting the curtain on fire, Mr. Freeze freezes a Molino national flag that's kind of hanging down so that it's like a a guillotine blade and falls Mm -hmm. and nearly hits the duo, nearly chops them in half, apparently. I thought that was a really clever idea. That makes it from the um, the preliminary into this draft, mm-hmm. but then doesn't make it past this draft. I wonder how they could have accomplished that. Well, it wouldn't be that difficult. Um, they could, you know, have a flag hanging and then, you know, cut away and show mm-hmm. that the flag is now this big, like, stiff as a board thing. They could, mm-hmm. you know, they could just build something out of wood and have it slam down. Yeah, and then um, put some, some fake snow expen- on it. Right. Perhaps the most expensive prospect here would be designing the Molina flag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which they would probably need to do, at least uh, in a cursory way. Hello, United but, Nations. Can you tell us what the Molina national flag looks like? No. <laughs> yeah. Could you just mash up a bunch of different flags for us? Um, and you know, we'll you know, maybe put some vaguely Portuguese slogan on it. And uh, Yeah. Hmm. Kind of a cool idea, if you ask me, yeah. but uh, not to be. Hmm. And then when it falls down, Freeze instant thaws it, and Batman and Robin get caught up in the flag. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when they they leave the building, they back climb down, but the rope and the side of the building are icy, so they fall and bounce and swing around on awnings to get to the ground. And that also would have been kind of difficult to shoot, I think. Yeah, not going to happen. <laughs> Just not going to happen. <laughs> Now, of course, you can do almost anything in an animated in cartoon. An animated cartoon, <laughs> but this is live action, so that's right. Mister Freeze's nine 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 is superimposed, translated to no, no, no. Thank you. <laughs> See what I mean about these phrases being <laughs> fairly familiar and certainly not esoterically German for most viewers. Yeah, well, I'm sure. Yeah, anybody around that time, or maybe even now, would know nine is German for no. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, in this version, there is nighttime sky riding of Strike Two Batman, and the duo do get frozen. Right. 
along with Cracked Lackey. <laughs> Sawete. My name is Stella, and I am the host of Backroll to Oracle, the Barbara Gordon podcast. Backroll to Oracle is a podcast dedicated to Barbara Gordon, the first woman to hold the mantle of Backroll for an extended period of time, roughly 1967 to 1988. The goal of Backroll to Oracle is to examine the character's history from her first appearance as Backroll and continuing through her tenure as Oracle. Each episode looks at a vintage issue of Detective Comics or Batman, as well as other books like Justice League and Freedom Fighters, and modern issues of Batgirl and Birds of Prey. I also keep track of news involving Batgirl and other members of the Bat family, and I have a revolving series of segments like Babs in the Tube, which highlights appearances of Babs in TV and film, Shipper Spotlight, which looks at a variety of comic and pop culture couples, gives their history, and determines whether they are hot or not, Reading with Stella, which could be described as an audio drama, or just me reading a book that relates to Babs or doesn't, and of course, the mainstay literature recommendation. I have been blessed to interview writers Scott Beatty and Chuck Dixon on their Backroll Year One work, Brian Q. Miller on his Backroll run, Dwayne Swarzynski and Christy Marks on their separate Birds of Prey work, and the creators and actors of the Backroll Spoiled, the web series. I hope to interview more creators and actors in the future. My goal, most importantly, is to make a fun, entertaining, and thoughtful show that people enjoy and from which they learn. Find the show online at thebatmanuniverse.net and iTunes, and follow the show on Facebook and Twitter at Batgirl to Oracle. Thank you, and fly on, Babs lovers. So then, on to part two. 38, part two. Now, Batman and Robin and the frozen lackey of Sandra's are all three in the, quote, morgue-like room, uh, slowly thawed by a man in white who is not a Ben Casey impersonator. <laughs> <laughs> is there a chance? What do you want? Miracles? I'm doing the best I can, the best I can do, and that's all I can do. Easy, no, Vince. This has been tough on all of us. And it's mentioned that the Diamond Exchange guard was also saved this way. So so he's tried to account for everybody who was frozen and make sure we know that they survived. But That's right. But I guess the lives of extras aren't worth a plug nickel. So it's all mm. just cut. <laughs> who cares about right. them? It's Batman <laughs> and Robin we're concerned about. Indeed. At the ball game, page 42... Sandra and Bruce arrive separately rather than together as shot. And she greets him, Bruce, darling. He calls her your Royal Highness. And she says, dear me, has it come to this? And yeah, as you mentioned, there's, there's a whole page of introducing her to, or, you know, here's Dick, here's Alfred, here's Aunt Harriet. Mm -hmm. Reintroductions because they all remember her. Of course, mm -hmm. which uh, gives credence to the notion, um, the, to the implication that Bruce and Sandra did date at one time before she became royalty. Bruce, you know my aunt, Mrs. Cooper, Princess Sandra. Aunt Harriet, of course, how are you? Mrs. Cooper makes an awkward attempt to curtsy. Mrs. Cooper, in the pink, Princess, how are you? Princess Sandra, excited. To Alfred, and dear, dear Alfred. Alfred, bowing, a pleasure, Your Highness. Princess Sandra, Dicky, little Dicky, Dick, polite but firm. Dick, not Dicky, please, Your Highness. He kisses her hand. So, I mean, you can see why this got cut. It's like nothing is happening here. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The lines that do make it to the final get all rearranged. A lot of things are rearranged about this scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of her saying that she has a few curves when she throws the ball out. She says, but watch out for my fastball anyway. Whatever. Right. <laughs> well, I think it's I see you commented that they lost the curves joke, um, which wasn't actually a terrible joke. Well, I'm, I'm sure I can't pitch like your great Paul Diamante, but well, I do have a few curves. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think he was, he was thinking that uh, the curves joke was better than what was here. Mm-hmm. So on page 45, Mr. Freeze himself gets on the PA at the ballpark to announce that Paul won't be able to pitch. And everybody's like, I know that voice. <laughs> and suddenly he breaks into his best impersonation of Harry Carey singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game. <laughs> <laughs> and then the actual announcer comes back and uh, is saying that Paul Diamante will not pitch today. 
Mm-hmm. I'm so confused, he says. Bruce and Dick don't give a reason for leaving. You know, as shot, it's the board meeting, which is super lame excuse. <laughs> <laughs> You don't forget a board meeting and schedule it right when you were supposed to accompany a princess to a ball game. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, super lame excuse and super funny joke both, you know, somehow fit together <laughs> as tactics that Bruce uses to uh, get around problems. Mm. Okay, so then at Gordon's office, page 47... Paul Diamante's Italian-accented landlady talks about the kidnappers taking him. (laughs) And as shot, Gordon just recounts what she said. According to Diamante's landlady, these three rather disreputable men visited Diamante's apartment this morning. And when she went up later to clean the apartment, no Diamante, only this note. Horowitz writes, lose landlady. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Robin Boy Blunderer on the message board said... Oof, glad the landlady was cut. Just awful dialogue dragging everything down. Because she says things like, That's all I know. Last night, four men, they go up to Mr. Paul Diamante's apartment. And you get the idea. Yeah, she's (laughs) as bad as your old Rossetti and Valentino mafia characters. (laughs) And uh, I uh, don't uh, see uh, or uh, hear uh, them uh, come uh, down. uh. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's almost that. Yeah, she's up to her elbows in spaghetti sauce. <laughs> Specy spicy meatballs. Indeed. Youch. <laughs> um, the rest of the scene proceeds pretty much as shot, but without Batman's dramatic line about how Paul must live to inspire the youth of today who will be the men of tomorrow, <laughs> which was a valuable addition. Indeed. Relentlessly square Batman line. So uh, Batman says he has to go alone. He doesn't say, I gave my word, as he does in the shot version. Oh, on page 49, by the way, uh, Diamante um, kills uh, the, they've killed the line. Um, This kooky character has me holed up out here in the craziest pad. Oh, there's Um, crazy again. Crazy gets knocked out of the script again by apparently Horowitz. Change to wildest as shot. Hmm. Shades of Preminger again. (laughs) Wild. There's no scene of Robin in the Batcave tracking Batman to freeze his hideout, and he doesn't at all put a homing device on Batman in this version. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. never discussed. Mm -hmm. Batman is picked up by Freeze at the stadium at night. Now, I thought that was interesting, the idea of shooting at the stadium, because the stadium was all stock footage. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right, except for the box. Yeah, except for the, the box. And, mm. <laughs> um, so, unless you're going <laughs> to land the chopper in the box, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> or superimpose it in the, um, the the stock footage. Yeah, or just, like, put, uh, go to the park and lay down a first baseline and pretend that, that you're <laughs> on the baseball diamond. Just yeah. crop it. Right, right. And, of course, uh, the chopper leaves Paul Diamante there and picks up Batman. And I was interested in the fact that it specifies Batman unties Paul's hands, which it's always bothered me as shot. Nobody unties his hands. Batman doesn't. Robin doesn't. Just leaves him there on a park bench (laughs) struggling to get out of these ropes. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, you know, he's he's the most valuable South paw pitcher the the eagles have and yet they're just going to leave him there with his hands tied in the park bench and then robin as shot says take what's something like, watch your pitching arm or something like you know good luck getting out of those ropes without injuring yourself <laughs> <laughs> i i can't figure out if that was done for humor or just an oversight yeah it's or, a good question I would have paid a lot, though, to see a cut in of him like, you know, 20 minutes later, sawing his ropes apart, you know, on a rock that he happened to find (laughs) lying around in the park. (laughs) Thanks a lot, Batman. (laughs) Of course, it's mentioned that the blackjack is used to hit Batman in the back of the head. Horowitz Mm. draws an arrow to the word blackjack and writes, let make whole speech about keeping his word. He won't resist. Then clunk him. 
Mm-hmm. So as shot, he says, I'm prepared to fulfill my part of the bargain. Do with me what you will, he says very dramatically, <laughs> and then mm-hmm. gets bonked. And he gets conked. Mm-hmm. Page 53, Robin arrives at the stadium in the back hopter. Right, which he's far too young to drive. Well, yeah, that was one problem. I think in the preliminary, uh, Hodge writes something like, if it exists. Yes. Preliminary script, page 18. Suddenly, seemingly from out of nowhere, a bat copter swoops down and lands very close to the startled, confused Diamante. Note, this is assuming the bat copter is in operation. If not, another method will be substituted. He seems to have just assumed that it existed when he wrote the the first draft. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Robin driving the bat copter. And Horowitz writes, what can we do so that Robin doesn't use copter? The answer, of course, is have him run in, in and out of the scene, then totally fudge the question of how he gets to freeze his hideout. <laughs> Taxi? <laughs> Human cannonball style. <laughs> so then at the hideout, the scene with Freeze and Batman is pretty much as shot. But they're in Freeze's bedroom and Batman's on the bed. <clears throat> okay. Which felt a little, a little creepy. <laughs> Dr. Schimmel, meet Dr. Wertum. Wertum, Schimmel. <laughs> <laughs> but then at the bottom of page 56, it turns into a judo match between Batman and Freeze. <laughs> Yeah, that that was wild, to say the least. Um, and it's happening in a cold area of the room. Now, of course, it's only zero. Well, in this script, it's now sub-zero, but it's not 50 below. Mm-hmm. So I guess Batman is okay, or maybe he's got bat skivvies on. Um, so they fight for a page and a half, and then the cold gets to him. Mm-hmm. Then Freeze's monologue there is about the same as broadcast, um, but then it kind of varies for the last part of the scene. And, uh, well, on page 60, we have Robin coming in for a landing at Freeze's, quote, hideaway, unquote, and in radio contact with Gordon Mm -hmm. for over two pages. So even if there had been a Batcopter at this stage, I think the scene would have been cut for time. (laughs) Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. (laughs) And it says that there are icicles forming on the moving helicopter blades. So how does that happen? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess extreme cold might do that, I guess. But special effects, once again, far too expensive. Mm. But just in terms of physics, I'm not sure if that works. Right. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Horowitz writes on 57, lose entire fight. Uh, maybe between takes one swing. No, I don't quite read. I can't quite read the rest of it. More doesn't make sense, is what it says. Mm-hmm. So Robin Boy Blunderer on the site wrote, uh, "Showing Robin's failure via frozen Batcopter blades ruins the surprise of Batman finding him in the dining room." So that's mm-hmm. another good point. Yeah, you know, it it works a lot better, I think, if we are surprised to see. You know, Batman surprised. We're a little surprised to right. see Robin there. We weren't expecting that. Where we would totally expect it if we saw him landing the Batcopter. Yeah, absolutely. At the stock footage hideaway. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the hideaway where they keep all the stock footage? Well, you've got it. It's got to go somewhere, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, the only time we see the outside is that one snowbound shot of a building. Right. So, yeah, I mean, the cost of of filming the scene is another problem. Mm Mm-hmm. Page 65, the scene with Freeze, Batman, and Robin at dinner, which is nearly the same as shot for a page and a half, and then it goes off in a different direction. And we get onto the topic of how Schimmel became Freeze, and Robin says it was an accident, but Freeze insists it was on purpose. Because if if it had been an accident, then Batman would have come to help him. But Batman says, well, I was knocked out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how Horowitz writes, all too talky, don't need. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I thought this kind of belated talking through of what happened felt 
really realistic for this show. Mm. I mean, I, it sounds almost like a conversation that would happen in real life outside of the solution that makes you need to be in 50 degree below temperatures. But, you know, kind of piecing something together and you would expect then that maybe Freeze would say, oh, I see. Well, OK, but, you know, he he sticks to his idea that Batman was malevol- malevolently doing this to him. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. overall, I mean, it felt like a really realistic conversation. Yeah, yeah, just about blame and, you know, two very different understandings of the same event. That does mm-hmm. I, I see what you're talking about. And then Robin says to Mr. Freeze, why are you so mean? <laughs> <laughs> Which Mr. Freeze doesn't understand and has to have it translated, more or less. Mm-hmm. Freeze talks about inventing his air-conditioned suit. You know, lots of talking. Then the scene finally gets more physical, and, you know, with the bit of trapping freeze in the nice warm 76 degrees temperature area. Mm-hmm. Then Batman and Freeze fight, you know, with the sound effects written on the screen and, you know, the whole nine yards. Robin mm-hmm. seems to stand off to the side or something. It doesn't mention him, just Batman and Freeze punching each other. And Horowitz writes, no long fight. And boys must be cleverer. And I wasn't quite sure. I, I guess he means out. they should be outwitting Freeze and not just slugging him. Possibly. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair guess. Although I think that idea was forgotten as the show went on, maybe by the end of season one. <laughs> <laughs> Bad guys, let's hit them. And Robin Boy Blunderer, on the next page, 68, noted Horowitz's note, Batman can't be dopey. But I wasn't quite sure how Batman was being dopey on that page. Yeah, I don't quite catch that either. Um, So Mr. Freeze is on the ropes. He's plunged into green-blue zero temperature without thinking Batman, this is 68, places the remote control panel on the table as he rushes to the door on the other side of the room. Robin following. Maybe that's the dopey thing, that he leaves the remote control behind so mm. that Mr. Freeze can then grab it. And it's also dopey script-wise because, you know, for Batman to just leave it there because then instead of there being, you know, some actual suspense built out of a new situation, it's basically the only suspense comes from who's got the remote control like, you know, mm. Batman's got it, and then he gives it up, and then Mr. Freeze has got it, and then he <laughs> gives it up, and then Batman's got it back. Um, it feels kind of cheap um, in terms of the dramatic seesaw that we're getting there. Yeah, so there's no slugfest with the henchmen. Mm-hmm. Um, Horowitz on the last page writes, end needs work. Let's talk it. Was he say talk it out? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to skip something there for the moment. Action is all out of sequence. Could use a fight with gang. Just uh, just with just Freeze with looking on helplessly, etc. Mm-hmm. Which, of course, is what we get in the final. But, right. yeah, just the sequence of things feels wrong. You know, mm-hmm. You've got the fight, and then then you know, several more pages before the cops get there uh, with things going really weird. Right. So there's no special super thermal B-long underwear. Naturally, you didn't know I was wearing my special super thermal B-long underwear for extreme cold. Batman and Robin have explosive pellets that they throw down together and create smoke. Mm-hmm. So... Free starts coughing and they can overpower him. But then, like, the, the henchmen come in with guns and they've got Batman and Robin cornered. Right. And then, this is a cardinal sin. The cops arrive and save Batman and Robin. Yes, and that's what Horowitz complains about that you right. held just now on that note on the last page. O'Hara and police shouldn't save Batman. <laughs> I mean, that's just a cardinal rule for practically any superhero story ever. The hero is supposed to win, not the cops. You know, this that's show right. is not O'Hara. O'Hara. No, it certainly isn't. <laughs> GCPD. 
Yeah, it's not. We're, this is not. Um, <laughs> this is not Greg Rucka and Ed Brubaker's Gotham Central series by any stretch. <laughs> no. Hmm. So yeah, I wrote in my notes heresy. <laughs> <laughs> And the written scene runs on past O'Hara's line about taking a wrong turn on the way there. Mm-hmm. And I did not understand this. For some reason, Batman and Robin and the other officers start laughing. And it says O'Hara realizes he's been duped. I think that the directions that Robin gave to the cops were incorrect on purpose so okay. that the cops wouldn't actually come to Freeze's hideout and screw up. Batman and Robin taking care of business. Okay. That's, yeah, that's that makes the sense. only theory I could come up with. But in the end, they end up saving Batman and Robin, at least in in, in this draft of the script. So mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, the irony is that um, they probably shouldn't have given O'Hara the wrong address, <laughs> as it turns out. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's just wrong. You, you can't do it this way. It's too many, too many switchbacks, you know, too many, mm-hmm. um, too many little clever bits that uh, the script can't mm-hmm. really sustain. Yeah. And then it goes on to have a little bit of Batman and Robin making up after Robin disobeyed Batman. Right. And Batman gave him the evil eye um, over their, their dinner um, with Mr. Freeze. Um, I, I don't think Batman would ever be that disappointed in robin and you know the the simple way would never allow for robin to disappoint batman that dramatically either Hmm. yeah robin says still sore at me for disobeying your orders not to follow you batman's answer is an affectionate hand briskly rubbing the top of robin's head robin smiles a beaming smile now that's another thing that doesn't work i don't think we ever saw batman tousle robin's hair I'm sure we didn't. I don't think yeah, we ever saw Bruce tousle Dick's hair. Right. <laughs> Maybe some verbal tousling, but never any actual hand-on yeah. hair tousling. I mean, again, not a chubby eight-year-old. Right, right. <laughs> He's in high school. You don't tousle a high school kid's hair. You want to get punched. <laughs> he may have to be told to go to the creek and brush his teeth, but he doesn't get his hair mussed up. <laughs> hmm. So, and then there is no tag scene written here. The bit with the the party and Bruce and Dick and the baked Alaska. Right. But I meant, I, another thing I realized watching this again. So I think we've sort of misconstrued Princess Sandra's line about being thankful for Paul Diamante. I wish Batman and Robin could have been here. I would love to have thanked them personally for this. And for this. <laughs> She doesn't mean that she's now dating him, which would be being unfaithful to her husband. Uh, She's she's happy that Batman saved him. You know, he was kidnapped, but he's back. So that's all she's saying, I think. But the fact that their arms are linked kind of suggests they're a couple. So Mm -hmm. the signals kind of get crossed there, I think. (laughs) Signals baseball. Uh The hygrolyphics (laughs) of baseball, as Harry Carey once again would say. (laughs) Hmm. Yeah, that that would be out of place considering um, the the Princess Grace connection. You know what we're supposed to assume about Princess Sandra's uh, becoming royalty and being loyal to her husband. Mm-hmm. Greetings from Wayne Manor Memoirs, a podcast dedicated to exploring the Batman mythos. Each episode, we research a character, story, contributor, or piece of pop culture related or adjacent. To the Dark Knight. And try to understand why these topics are important to the Bat Mythos. I'm Joe. I'm Kendall. And some of our favorite topics include the transformation of Mr. Zero into Mr. Freeze, the early appearances of the Riddler, Booster Gold, Commandi, Jim Aparo, and many, many more. Check out Wayne Manor Memoirs every other Friday, wherever you download your podcasts. And follow us at Wayne Manor Memoirs on Facebook or at W Memoirs on Twitter. Until next time, Bat Fanatics, be brave and stay bold. Coming up, Adam West on Victor Bono's comedy album and on Batman Bubblegum Cards, and we read your mail in the Bat Inbox. 
Help support To The Bat Pulls and all the Deconstructing Comics shows with a monthly donation to the Deconstructing Comics Patreon page at patreon.com slash deconcomics. For just $2 a month, you get outtakes from every To The Bat Pulls episode. Plus, Paul and I make bi-weekly videos for all patrons, usually featuring a TV trivia quiz. But in next week's video, we have a fun half-hour conversation on the question, We loved the Batman TV show as kids. Why did we end up making Spider-Man comics? It's a look into our own origin story that you won't want to miss. Patrons can also vote in polls for which bat topic you'd like us to cover next. Further perks at higher support levels, including the right to have an ad for your own project on the show once a month, and hours of podcasts on the early issues of The Amazing Spider-Man and on the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So go to patreon.com slash deconcomics and select the level of your monthly donation. Thanks for listening and thanks for your support. What's your question? Uh, for Adam West. Go ahead, he's on the line. I um, met him about a year and a half ago at a convention. I was wondering if he ever got a chance to listen to that Victor Bono album. Uh, yes, David, I have. As a matter of fact, uh, I have it here at the house uh, in Idaho, and uh, it, it's, it's very funny. I think it's as funny today as it was when he recorded it. Um, I'm glad you liked it. It was. Um, I had an extra cop, and I just thought you might enjoy listening to it. It's uh, very funny. I... Are you the one who sent it? Yes. Oh, thank you, David. It's not often that we get a chance to talk to a fan who, you know, who sent us something. Uh, usually, you know, it's, it's, it's someone we never meet. This is great. Well, I got, I got to, um, I got to hand it to you at the, um, when you were doing the convention in, at the Disneyland Hotel. About well, I remember your hand, David. And what did you think of, you know, seeing your faces on uh, bubble cum cards? Well, it's better than bubble gum in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I think I still have some of my shoes. Right. But, no, that's fine. Uh, you know, it's a, a strange thing when I'm on location, um, like I was in Sweden not too long ago, and people came up to me with those bubblegum cards, so I guess they're they're collectible. Yeah, they're really neat. Yeah, Maybe like it was cap. because you were wearing your tights then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks I don't think you that's guys. funny, Bert. As a matter of fact, if I were there... Wowie zowie! Holy fisticuffs! <laughs> All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you, you guys. All right, thank you. All right, and now Adam West has to go back. Really Please watch your guys wear tights. <laughs> Adam West has think to go about back. That, Bert. I mean, just think about a few people who did. Right? Who, who wore tights Look, besides us? Uh, William Tell. William Tell. Robin Hood. That's the guy with the apple in his mouth. That's right. Robin Hood. Robin Hood. That's true. That's true. Daffy Duck. Daff oh, Daffy Duck. Well, I, that's questionable. Captain Blood. Captain Blood. Golly gee. How about Captain Quick? Did you say golly gee? You're on a clean show, Bert. <laughs> What's wrong with golly gee? <laughs> Adam West, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking time out. Uh, you, you can go back to feeding the Malamudes right now. Okay. Uh, and we're going to continue. Uh, get into the bad cave. We have more to do on Carol A. And thank you very much, Adam. Okay? Thank you, Harv. Okay, Bat Inbox, where we read your cards and letters, sort of like viewer mail on David Letterman, the old show, that is. Um, a few highlights of your response to our discussion of the 1997 film Batman and Robin, as posted on the all-seeing, all-knowing 66 Batman message board. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. how rude. <laughs> C-3PO lives, baby. There's a lot of commentary there, including a variety of opinions on the movie, and the thread is linked from our show notes if you want to read it all. And boy, oh boy, is my face red when we get to uh, Danny Cool's letter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I feel like he's really, really got some points there. So uh, let's start out with Tim reading a letter from Camden. Yeah. Camden says, I hear too often this movie, Batman and Robin criticized by Batman fans who do not appreciate the 60s show, and it was refreshing to hear you two cite why a comparison between those two is hardly warranted. Something that I appreciate about the initial series of Batman films was that there was a better character arc, with our title character starting off as a dark, vengeful character and eventually lightening up to accept his protégés as his new family. It's honestly gotten quite boring, and for the last two and a half decades that we've been stuck with just the dark, vengeful interpretation with the rebooted Nolan films, 
up to what they're doing now with the upcoming Robert Pattinson movie. I hope one day there can be another attempt at trying to make a lighter and brighter Batman film, closer in the vein of a Dick Sprang or Carmine Infantino comic, which the best of the 60s show emulated. Hmm. Yeah, I'm guessing that would probably make you pretty happy as well, Tim, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sick to death of dark, brooding Batman who kills people and, and mm. uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, I don't think that history is going to be all that kind to the, ba- the Ben Affleck Batman. Mm. Okay, and I can't bring myself to watch either of the Justice League movies, whether the you know the Joss Whedon cut or the Zack Snyder cut, especially mm. since I really don't have four and a half hours to kill right now <laughs> watching the Zack Snyder cut. <laughs> it's like watching Wagner's Got a Damrug or something. <laughs> okay, Batwing Hornet writes: uh, Over the decades, Batman has a few markers almost universally identified as destructive blows to the character. One would be the much, uh, much of the late golden, early Silver Age Batman comics. For some, it's part of the 66 series, second in most of its third season. Still others point to Legends of the Superheroes, yeah, and the Schumacher film discussed here. They would not be incorrect picking any of those productions, but for Batman and Robin, being a part of a continuing series to be such a cartoony, illogical, loud mess, barely recognizable as a Batman film, served a serious death blow to the image of the character in live-action form. Well, um, he, he, Batwing Tornado certainly does have a point um, in terms of you know how the fans reacted. Um, the movie basically reached up out of the toilet and flushed itself down as far <laughs> as box office was concerned. Mm-hmm. Back to the letter here. Despite the desire and studio wrangling to find some way of bringing one of DC's flagship characters back to the big screen, the specter of the gaudy garbage called Batman and Robin was a roadblock of sorts. Tell us how you really feel. (laughs) (laughs) Think of it. A genuine pop culture icon character recognized far beyond comic book readers took eight years, nearly another decade, before a live-action Batman would be seen again with Nolan's landmark Batman Begins. Perhaps the idea needed distance from the Schumacher disaster allowing it to not be so fresh a memory to audiences. That, and in between 1997 and 2005, other comics adaptations were released, e.g. Blade, two of the Raimi Spider-Man movies, the X-Men, and other less successful entries, doing their best to be disassociated from the silly, cartoony stigma Schumacher's movie crazy glued to the idea of superhero films. Mm, Nice metaphor there. Mm. And this, this letter got me to thinking that those four Batman films do not make a cohesive series to the point where I I had kind of forgotten that they were all supposed to be the same Batman. I, I repeatedly have to remind myself, I mean, you know, it's the same Alfred and the same Commissioner Gordon, but mm-hmm. nothing else seems the same. Certainly if you compare 89 to Batman and Robin, they seem completely different. Do you think that's um, largely um, a, a exponent of the change in directors or the change in actors or maybe a little of each? Um, well, I think if it had just been a change in actors, there still would have been a more consistent tone. But mm-hmm. I think the change in directors is what really causes that that dissonance between the first two and the second two. Yeah, in some ways the the visual design doesn't change that much. It's still very kind of German expressionistic by way of you know of Paul Dini, you know, or um, uh, kind of you know Batman Adventures um, sort of or Batman animated series sort of uh, cartooniness. But yeah, I see where you're coming from with that. Yeah, I mean it. Yeah, it kind of is, and yet it's it's still kind of different. The Tim Burton films don't have all those big muscular statues all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, the uh, the right <laughs> kind of the gay bodybuilder culture look mm-hmm. of the entirety of the city's public art. Yeah. Okay. Artemis Canab writes, listening to this episode brought back a repressed memory of mine. A friend and I were walking past the Toronto Planet Hollywood just before this movie came out, and we saw they were having their grand opening that day. So we went in. We were told that Arnold would be making a special appearance. So we waited maybe two hours until he arrived. They weren't actually serving food that day. So, <laughs> so we walked around looking at the collection of Canadian movie memorabilia. 
For the last half hour or so, every screen and speaker in the building was blasting the Batman and Robin trailer on a loop, but we somehow stuck it out. Arnold eventually walked out into the crowd, but the room was packed shoulder to shoulder, so we couldn't see him until he got on a platform. He gave a little speech, added, Toronto, I'll be back, and left. What a day. <laughs> Very funny. You know, the, the reason you probably couldn't see him until he got on the platform is he's only like five foot six, right? <laughs> he's, he's a very short man um, in spite of his uh, muscle boundedness. And here we go. Danny Cool. Um, mm. Okay. Oy vey, Danny says. The final Schumacher Batman without a single camping trip? I should read this like Desmond Doomsday. Not even a quick weekend down by the river? Don't leave me hanging with all these Frankfurters. Paul, the bat buns are going stale. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of bat buns, we certainly see plenty of close-ups of bat buns and those (laughs) zoom-ins of whatever Batman and Robin put their costumes on in in this film. Uh, Does Dan E. Cool enjoy 1997's Batman and Robin? Asked by literally no one. Yes, of course he does, but probably only ironically. Does that make it camp? In the strictest definition of camp? Yeah, maybe, I guess. Paul's statement that the production values in Batman and Robin are too high to qualify as real high camp is thought-provoking. Nevertheless, I did disagree, because what fun would it be if I didn't? (laughs) Is the execution of Batman and Robin not over the top enough? Was our good director Joel S. not naive enough? In what way does the budget of the film detract from its campiness? That's a serious question, and I'm dying to know the answer. On our scale of naive camp is greater than camping, uh, Batman and Robin must be graded closer to the left than to the right. This is one of the greatest examples ever of style over substance caught on film, and I don't think for a minute that Schumacher realized that what he was creating was so far off the mark, which is more than reason enough to love it. Um, You got me there, Dan. Uh, It was not a not a good moment for me not to, you know, construct at least a a little foray off into the mountains for a camping trip on this one or into the the uh, the um, the statuary of Gotham City. Yeah, yeah, the uh, the over the topness. I think you know there may be a kind of special dimension or special zone of camp that we're talking about here, where you're trying for camp so hard that somehow it becomes this other kind of um, almost like you know transcendent camp. <laughs> <laughs> that you know um, the the Schumacher is so in love with the over the top aesthetic that um, it, it almost um, starts to get out of hand um, mm. to the point where it might be understood as kind of coming out as naive or, you know, at the at the other end somehow. Mm. Like, you know, he begins to think that he's making this kind of camp masterpiece, <laughs> um, whereas what he's doing is just making the most expensive schlock ever produced um, <laughs> that takes itself extremely seriously as camp, which may actually be camp. <laughs> and not just camping. So, Danny, you've given us a lot to think about, and uh, I may have to, um, you know, stick my head in a big bucket of bat water for a while and just meditate on this for a while. <laughs> okay, so if you would like to comment on our episodes or ask us anything, uh, you can post on the thread for each episode uh, on the sixty-six uh, Batman message board, or you can write uh, to us uh, <laughs> at batpulls at deconstructingcomics.com. We're always happy to hear from you, and if you've never dropped us a line before, don't let that stop you. We uh, we really enjoy reading your letters, both on the air and off. So next time, we're going to be talking about some of the Batman records released by Power Records in the 1970s. Um, this is kind of, you know, way back at the beginning of our, sh- our series, we were talking about kind of tracking the effects of the Batman show, you know, long after it was canceled. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to look at these and see how much effect the show might have had on them. And joining us to discuss these records will be J.B. Anderton of the Bat 77 podcast. Excellent. So, um, and also the author of the Deconstructing Comics podcast theme. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know that. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, he's a musician as well as being a podcaster and a Batman fan. Excellent. I need to listen to Deconstructing Comics a lot more frequently than I do. (laughs) So, we'll see you again in two weeks at the same Bat RSS feed. (laughs) 
Check the show notes for the Derek Paravicini version of the theme, the scripts we discussed, and the message board thread about our Batman and Robin episode. Batpolls at DeconstructingComics.com is the address to send us your bat missives or any interesting bat audio that we haven't used yet on the show. Thanks to Chris Cavanaugh for the Adam West clip you heard in this episode. We're on Twitter at Decon Comics, and recent Bat Polls episodes are now available on the Deconstructing Comics YouTube channel. You can hear outtakes from this and every episode of To the Bat Polls and vote for topics for future episodes by supporting us at patreon.com slash deconcomics. You can also help us out by sending a one-time PayPal donation to batpulls at deconstructingcomics.com, by shopping via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon, by sharing our episodes on your social media, and by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And spread the word. Let all your friends who are Batman 66 fans know about the show. Next time, J.B. Anderton joins us to talk about Power Records' 1970s Batman discs. Keep those bat platters spinning. We'll see you in two weeks. To the Bat Poles is a production of DeconstructingComics.com.